Welcome to the COPD Foundation podcast. We bring you insights from leading health professionals, inspiring stories from those living with lung conditions, practical advice, and the latest in lung health research. Be sure to subscribe, follow us on social media, and visit copdfoundation.org. Take action today, breathe better tomorrow. Just a quick note before we jump into our topic. This podcast series was created for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for formal medical advice. Talk to your healthcare provider if you have any questions. Welcome to the COPD Foundation podcast. I'm Stephanie Williams, a respiratory therapist and educator at the COPD Foundation. And I'm Amanda Atkinson, a registered nurse, and I too am an educator at the COPD Foundation. Today, we'll be talking with Dr. Sandy Sandhouse about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, bronchiectasis, and non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease, or NTM for short. These three lung diseases are more prevalent than you might think. Dr. Sandhouse, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Sandy Sandhouse. I am a pulmonologist uh, based in Denver at uh, National Jewish Health where I've uh, run the Alpha-1 clinic uh, for the past uh, 40 years or so, um, uh, specializing only in Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient patients. Um, I also am the medical director of the Alpha-1 Foundation and AlphaNet, a not-for-profit disease management organization, both based in uh, Carl Gables, Florida. Thank you for being here with us. And as we're diving into a fascinating and often complex topic geared toward our healthcare professional audience, let's level the playing field and explain what bronchiectasis, non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are and how they often overlap. Stephanie, these conditions can sometimes present similarly and even coexist, which really could make diagnosis and treatment challenging. Dr. Sandhouse, can you help explain what alpha-1 and bronchiectasis are? Certainly, I'd be happy to. Um, Bronchiectasis is a uh, condition in which the uh, bronchial tubes of the lungs are damaged and uh, usually are dilated um, so that, and when they're severe, um, it's impossible for those airways to clear secretions from the lung uh, without a lot of help, and that um, trapped secretions often become uh, very thick and prove to be, in some patients, a breeding ground for uh, bacteria and other organisms uh, that can lead to chronic or recurrent lung infections in, in the worst cases of uh, bronchiectasis. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which we'll call alpha-1 for short here, um, is a genetic condition uh, that leads to the uh, deficiency of the major anti-inflammatory protein, alpha-1 antitrypsin, in the blood. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is made in the liver and released into the blood in great quantities in healthy individuals who don't have an abnormal alpha-1 gene, but individuals with two abnormal alpha-1 genes can have extremely low levels um, of, uh, of this important protein. And when that happens... Um, patients are very susceptible to getting both bronchiectasis and pulmonary emphysema destruction of the air sacs of the lung. Thank you for explaining it so beautifully. And one last illness to explain is NTM lung disease. NTM is caused by non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which are environmental bacteria found in water and soil. While they don't usually cause problems for healthy individuals, they can lead to serious lung infections in people with underlying lung conditions like bronchiectasis or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. As I understand it, all of these conditions can be categorized as rare diseases. And you know, Stephanie, it's likely that people don't really realize how often they can coexist in an individual. Yeah, that's a good point. Dr. Sandhouse, do you have anything on that to share with us? Patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency uh, have a very high incidence of bronchiectasis. In one study done in the UK, as many as 94% of patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency have bronchiectasis. Wow, that's a lot of overlap. And we know that up to as many as 50% or more of patients that have COPD also have bronchiectasis. Wow is right. Those really are large numbers. And man, that really drives home the need to make sure that people are being tested for alpha-1. 
You know, I learned something really shocking, um, just some shocking numbers about Alpha One recently, that only one in 10 people that have Alpha One actually have received a diagnosis. Dr. Sandhouse, when should a clinician test somebody for Alpha One? It's important to note that most uh, medical societies that put out uh, guidelines regarding diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency um, recommend that every patient with a diagnosis of COPD should be tested once in their life for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, Because it's a genetic condition, you only need to test once to find out if someone has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Unfortunately, um, most um, physicians don't follow these guidelines. um, And they often don't uh, test for alpha-1 until someone gets a chest X-ray or a CT scan or a pulmonary function test that uh, suggests uh, lung disease with low diffusing capacity and, and obstruction out of proportion to their smoking history or their age and things like that. And so a select number of people get tested for alpha-1. But the data shows that about 1% of all COPD patients have undetected alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So that's a huge number of patients that are not detected. Yes, it is important to make sure that as clinicians, we're following the approved guidelines. There are many ways that somebody can get tested for alpha-1, including a blood test or a cheek swab. Genotyping is really important because it will document what what the genes are that a person has if their alpha-1 antitrypsin levels are low. Unfortunately, we now... Um, know of hundreds of mutations of the alpha-1 gene. And there are several mutations that have been identified that give you normal alpha-1 levels of a protein that doesn't work. They're somewhat rare compared to the usual Z and S, which are the two most common abnormal alpha-1 genotypes, um, and require genotyping to find them. The good news is there's a lot of ways to get free genotyping. Um, Some of the companies that make augmentation therapy provide kits. The Alpha One Foundation has a free test kit program where the results go right to the patient. They can do the test at home and get the results sent to them, and they can decide what to do with that information. Many people use that to test their family members because a family member often uh, winds up with having one abnormal gene. Since we're talking about diagnostic approaches... For bronchiectasis, a high-resolution CT scan is the gold standard. It can reveal the extent of bronchial dilation and help rule out other conditions like interstitial lung diseases. Um, It's important to point out that bronchiectasis is an anatomic diagnosis. You see it on most prominently on CT scans, and people can have dilation of their bronchial tubes and meet criteria for bronchiectasis and have no symptoms or problems uh, because of that. So the vast majority of people with alpha-1 have bronchiectasis, but fortunately in the majority of individuals, that bronchiectasis doesn't cause them any particular medical problems, although it's likely if they get an exacerbation of their lung disease that it's worse. The diagnosis of bronchiectasis is usually an incidental finding on a CT scan, for instance, um, unless someone is searching for it because someone has a chronic cough that looks infected, that ha- where the cough occurs every day, um, and there's evidence of waxing and waning infections and evidence of, of, of uh, ongoing pulmonary problems, uh, that would often prompt a physician to look for bronchiectasis and a patient to think about whether they have bronchiectasis and ask their patients to they ask their physician to test them. Um, but there's a group of alpha-1 patients who get colonized with bad bacteria um, and get symptomatic from their bronchiectasis. People with symptomatic bronchiectasis often report a daily cough with a production of large amounts of sputum and recurrent lung infections as some of the most prominent signs. Yes, and for NTM lung disease, sputum cultures and sometimes bronchoscopy are necessary to identify the specific mycobacterial species that are involved. Molecular testing can also be really useful in certain cases. These simple tests can lead to targeted treatments and lifestyle changes that can slow the progression of lung disease. 
Unfortunately, it often takes several years from the onset of symptoms to a definitive diagnosis. For bronchiectasis, patients can experience symptoms for years, often being treated for recurrent infections before a high-resolution CT scan confirms the diagnosis. Dr. Sandhouse, do you have any advice for primary care physicians when they're looking for these conditions? I think that that probably all of the um, primary care docs um, understand bronchiectasis, have heard of alpha-1, and um, wonder what to do when NTM appears on a, cult, on a sputum culture. Um, the, the problem is that NTM is a ubiquitous organism, and so it can appear on a culture and yet not be causing significant disease in an individual. Just a culture positivity of an NTM organism does not mean someone has clinically significant NTM, and but that would prompt someone to look at a CT scan, um, do do pulmonary function testing, uh, listen to the patient's history. Do they have night sweats? Do they have uh, you know chronic cough um, that's out of proportion to their existing bronchiectasis? Something like that. Um, and then there are very characteristic um, appearances of an NTM infection on a CT scan, most prominently something called tree and bud appearance, which is uh, what the inflammation caused by, um, caused by NTM organism on a CT scan looks like. It looks like a tree in bud uh, as it invades the lung tissue itself. Um, so it's a very pretty sounding picture of a disease that can be very difficult to treat. Dr. Sandhouse, you mentioned targeted treatments and lifestyle changes. Is there anything that a clinician would need to know about managing these conditions when they overlap that might be different than management of these conditions on their own? That's, that's a great question. Um, the first thing to point out is that patients that have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and bronchiectasis are much at greater risk, at much greater risk of getting NTM infection. Um, at National Jewish, where we have a whole service that that um, treats NTM patients, whether lung infected or or other uh, organ affected, um, everyone gets tested for alpha one and cystic fibrosis because both of those conditions are overrepresented in the population of patients who gets NTM. Um, since NTM or non tuberculous mycobacteria or, or um, M AVM intracellulari or MAI, all these different initials that you'll see on the web, um, since uh, the um, the lung develops a a clinical infection with those, in uh, these organisms uh, take a step back. Um, these organisms are ubiquitous in the environment these NTM bugs. And everyone's exposed to them all the time. So the reason that someone gets NTM has to do with susceptibility within the lungs to having NTM setting up, setting up shop in the lungs and invading the tissues. And we know from uh, studies we've done at National Jewish that um, about 50% of patients who get significant NTM infections significant enough to be referred to National Jewish, have either or both um, abnormal alpha-1 antitrypsin genes or abnor and or abnormal cystic fibrosis genes. Um, and so knowing those um, can help direct the, uh, the treatment. For instance, in someone who has NTM that's not responding to usual antibiotic therapy, if they have one or two abnormal alpha-1 antitrypsin genes, we often give them the augmentation therapy <clears throat> and um, uh, find that they respond better to the, um, to the usual antibiotics, uh, whether first line, second line, or third line, uh, than, they, than they were doing before we gave them that therapy. And similarly, if someone has cystic fibrosis along with uh, their NTM, treatment of this uh, potential treatment of the cystic fibrosis also aids in the clearance of these bugs, which are often difficult to treat and require in patients who are severely affected by NTM long-term treatment with multiple antibiotics as the uh, as the therapy. 
Um, not everyone needs those uh, those prolonged and multiple antibiotics. Um, sometimes uh, the most important things are the same things that you do for bronchiectasis without NTM, which uh, all revolve around clearance of secretions from the lung through various ver techniques that um, most physicians uh, um, know about just from treating bronchiectasis per se. It's important to note that, you know, you can have bronchiectasis without NTM or without infections. Um, it's often important for, the, for a typical bronchiectasis patient, whether they have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency or not, um, there's often the occasional um, use of antibiotics, uh, a kind of a, uh, um, aggressive uh, antibiotic regimen when the bacterial numbers start to increase. Uh, there's always going to be bacteria living in those uh, uh, very nutritious for bacteria uh, secretions of bronchiectasis. Um, and the usual bronchiectasis patient has to get what we used to call a tune-up, um, where they uh, have to be on, um, whether they have NTM or not, wind up on antibiotics, whether intravenous, oral, or by inhalation, uh, and sometimes a combination of that to kind of knock down that reservoir of, of bugs that are living in those, in those uh, bronchiectatic airways um, and get someone back to their baseline again. Um, so it's a complicated life um, for someone with significant bronchiectasis. And alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency simply adds um, to, the, to that uh, complication. Um, we're really not sure why people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency seem to be more susceptible to getting NTM. We don't know if it's uh, simply the fact that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficient patients have bronchiectasis um, uh, almost routinely, um, and so that makes it a more hospitable place for NTM to grow, or whether there's something about the deficiency itself that makes the lungs more hospitable for NTM to invade. Um, and so that's the reason why if, if the usual therapies aren't working, we sometimes turn to augmentation therapy to treat the alpha-1 um, as an added step um, in patients with uh, alpha-1 and bronchiectasis with NTM um, who uh, are not necessarily responding uh, to the usual complicated regimens that we, <laughs> that we wind up uh, putting our patients on. You also mentioned augmentation therapy for the treatment of alpha-1, and that is really great. But it makes me wonder, are there any innovations on the horizon for alpha-1 and antitrypsin deficiency therapy? We're in the, in, currently in clinical trials with much longer-lasting therapies or with therapies that can be taken by mouth and things like that. So the therapies in the, of the future will probably not be as um, difficult uh, for patients to tolerate. Um, but the uh, most important thing is the education. We have people who were diagnosed early, especially by doing family testing, where you identify a patient at uh, with alpha-1, you also identify a family at risk since it's a hereditary genetic condition. That is really exciting news. Well, everybody, our time together today has come to a close. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Sandhouse. And as always, we really appreciate your expertise. Yes, thank you very much for an informative discussion, and thank you to our listeners for spending time with us. For more information on bronchiectasis, visit our Bronchiectasis and Non-Tuberculous Mycobacterium Lung Disease Initiative website at bronchiectasisandntm360.org. You can also find information regarding Alpha-1 in the COPD Foundation 101 Library on the COPD Foundation website. You'll also find links to these websites in the podcast description for this episode. The COPD Foundation has a wealth of resources for healthcare providers and for your patients. Join us on COPD 360 Social to keep the conversation going. You can also follow us on all major social media channels. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Be on the lookout for more episodes where we delve into other critical topics in respiratory and infectious diseases. Until next time. Thank you for tuning in to the COPD Foundation podcast. And remember, whether you're managing a chronic lung condition, providing support to those who are, or just want to learn more about lung health, the COPD Foundation is here to support you. 
be sure to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media. Take action today. Breathe better tomorrow.